ஓகே சார் we will wait for one minute sir we will start that youtube live live stream forum strength is 20 20 it is that is 22 agide okay we have given the youtube link also so there will be lot of people joining there also or seeing it later <clears throat> it will be recorded that is the fond hope illa re nortta idare illa sir later on if you go and see uh, yeah, you can yeah. able to see how many people have visited how many people have innor innor munnu irutte alva getting we can see ha hmm. all these programs what we have done since february everything is there in uh, kcsi youtube so still you can go and watch so we might dr nas they all have lot of followers வெரி குட் ஈவினிங் Uh, welcome everyone for this uh, guest lecture on a very important topic ultrasound for uh, general surgeon and endoscopy for general surgeon so we have two eminent speakers dr rasadashiv sopimat sir and dr naz madam uh, and the entire session will be moderated by our uh, chairman elect dr narayan hepsur so before that i request uh, our chairman uh, dr hv shivram sir to welcome everyone Uh, thank you dr chandrashekar good evening everybody um, one of the important meeting we are having today the surgeons many of them aspire to learn robotic surgery advanced laparoscopic surgery but forget that we also have to learn ultrasound and endoscopy which has become very very basic for the general surgeon to survive and also practice so it's my earnest request from the beginning that during the post graduate time itself they should start learning not only endoscopy but even bedside ultrasound it has become very very important tool like a stethoscope so there is no uh, escape from learning these two technologies which will make a surgeon a complete surgeon in that direction we are having this webinar today and we have very eminent two speakers and moderated by none other than our chairman elect i hand over to dr narayan hepsur to moderate the session and conduct the webinar thank you very much thank you sir thank you chairman thank you chandru and i now uh, we straight forward we'll go into the program i request uh, dr sopimat sir uh, who is a eminent uh, surgeon i don't think so he needs any introduction he is a master in endoscopy he was the one who started endoscopy in hubli and uh, not only in hubli he popularized it all over karnataka he has conducted several uh, programs all over uh, india and uh, he is a master of endoscopy and laparoscopic surgery i hereby present uh, dr sopimat i request uh, dr sopimat to please start his session I think Dr. Naz will present first. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. And uh, Dr. Naz is the one, uh, madam, who doesn't need any introduction. She is not attached to any medical college, but she is there in all academic activities of all the surgical society. Not only that, even in IMA, she is one of the eminent uh, doctors who is very ac- academically active in, in all the participation. she there is uh, no words which can uh, describe her better as an academician rather than uh, uh, just a practicing surgeon so hereby i present dr naz madam kindly present your presentation and it will be very interesting she has started from a scratch in a small place called hospite and uh, now it is uh, the hospite is uh, naz is uh, naz madam is known for hospite and hospite is known for dr naz so with this small introduction i would like to request dr nas to please start dr nas madam you're there yes i'm there i'm there Oh. 
worry about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just, just a second. Meantime, you can. Yeah, yeah. Good explain. evening, everyone. Uh, at the, uh, thank you, Dr. Hepsur, for those kind words. And uh, I, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, uh, KSEASI, Dr. Shivram, and the uh, team of KSEASI, uh, very active team, uh, for uh, uh, choosing this topic and allotting this uh, talk to me. Uh, ultrasound the surgeon, for surgeons. Ultrasound, as Sir just mentioned, it is a visual stethoscope, and each one of us should be uh, changing from the regular stethoscope to the uh, visual stethoscope. Uh, before I start this presentation, it, uh, I would like to uh, uh, give a disclaimer that this presentation is intended to create an interest among the surgeons to learn bedside ultrasound for better patient care, and there is no intention to express our superiority over the specialists. We would continue to need their help and support for all diagnostic and interventional work. Now, the contents would be the need for surgeons to do ultrasound, basics of ultrasound, understanding the machine that is nobology, interpreting some images, and a few words about my journey. Now, why should a surgeon perform ultrasound? I would rather ask, why not? Now, from the surgeon's point of view, we are all highly motivated and want to give the best patient care. The equipment is compact, affordable, and there is no need for extensive training, and it is user-friendly. And there is a surgeon-patient benefit. That is, the cost can be reduced to a great extent. It saves time for the patient and the surgeon. And whenever there's a repeat usage, we can do it as many number of times, and we may not even charge. And of course, it generates income. We, we see that ultrasound usage has increased in emergency care by the intensivists. Obstetricians and gynecs are performing ultrasound. Physicians perform ultrasound. And in the trauma setting, uh, we, uh, uh, it makes uh, the fast makes it mandatory for each one of us to know the basics of ultrasound. And the situation demands intraoperative and endo ultrasound. And it is a very useful bedside tool for the transplant surgeons. Now coming to focus, that is point of care ultrasound usage by surgeons. There is a moderately good evidence for routine use of ultrasound by surgeons for gallbladder, thyroid, parathyroid, DVT, and tra trauma scanning and in neurology. Whereas there is a weaker evidence for iota, breast, hernia, arterial, and venous scanning. Uh, I would uh, rather put a clause here that one-stop breast clinics and vascular clinics would definitely have a greater accuracy. There are some SAGES guidelines for granting ultrasound privileges for surgeons, which has been uh, approved by the Joint Commission on Accreditations of Healthcare Organizations. And the basic premise is that all surgeons must have the judgment and training to perform ultrasound. And the privilege must be granted for a particular category. And the minimal requirement is a surgical residency which incorporates ultrasound during the training, which must be certified for documentation. And for those who have not received any training during surgical residency, there should be a structured training program or it should be based on clinical ex practical experience. Now, the International Consensus Conference recommendations on ultrasound education for undergraduate medical students. We are talking of postgraduate, but it has been approved for undergraduate students and uh, the, which has been published in last year. And according to this, uh, it should the ultrasound education should be incorporated in the undergraduate medical uh, educate curriculum itself for better understanding of the anatomy, pathology, and the surgical aspects. Now, coming to a little basics of the ultrasound, we all know that it is uh, ultrasound is nothing but uh, sound waves, and uh, we have the audible sound between two, 20 to 20,000 hertz. That about 20,000 is ultrasound, and medical ultrasound is 2 lakh hertz to 15 lakh mega hertz, that is megahertz. And between 50 to 60 uh, megahertz is used for specialized imaging and, and therapeutic applications. That it is also called as a high intensity focused ultrasound. <clears throat> now, uh, ultrasound is uh, based on the pulse echo principle. That is, the, there is a crystal of lead zirconate, which is electrically pulsed. It changes its shape and it vibrates, producing a sound beam. With this passes through the tissue, various undergoes, undergoes various changes, and that which is reflected back comes back to the crystal uh, and produces an electrical voltage. This is a reverse piezo piezoelectric effect, which, which is the bone for the ultrasound. And this is mapped and interpreted in a gray scale. We have to understand some words like acoustic impedance and attenuation. 
Acoustic impedance is a tissue property. It depends upon the reflectors which are present in the tissue, that is the resistance given by the tissue. Whereas attenuation is a loss of energy by reflection, refraction, scatter, and thermal absorption. And this is directly proportional to the frequency. Higher frequency, attenuate faster. Now, what happens when an ultrasound beam enters the body? It gets reflected, refracted, absorbed, and it gets scattered. And that the reflected beam is the echo and forms the basis of the ultrasound. And it occurs when there is an interface between two structures. That is the, the, the two tissues having a different acoustic impedance. If there is no difference, no echo is produced. If the difference is small, a, a weak echo is produced and the difference is too high, the echo is so strong that it may get totally reflected. Like for example, uh, air body interface or the presence of bone. Now there are some reflectors we should understand are, uh, are different types of reflectors like the diaphragm, some blood vessels, they act as mirrors and they reflect the ultrasound waves completely. And there are medium reflectors like in the muscle and small reflectors also called speckles in the, the solid organs. Now, there are some artifacts. These are not, on, uh, not only confusing, but these are the basis of making a diagnosis. Some artifacts may confuse us, but some of them help us to make a diagnosis. So for example, if you look at this, these are parallel lines what you see, and this is what you see in the bladder here. These are due to repeated reflections of the sound beam which comes back and hits the surface. And this produces what is called as a reverberation artifact. And you have the comet tail artifacts which come down and they, they do not reach the posterior, uh, the low, lower part of the screen. And these are examples seen in uh, uh, cholestrosis of the gallbladder. And these are some ring down artifacts and which are due to uh, uh, air trapped between the uh, fluid, bub uh, fluid bubbles. And there you, you get this uh, ring down artifact which reaches the bottom. And this is usually produced by the gas bubbles, presence of the gas. And this usually produces a little dirty shadow. And then you have a twinkle artifact behind the uh, bladder calculus. And uh, th that when you throw the color, the same ring down artifact appears like a twinkle artifact. And now coming to the acoustic shadowing, this is another important feature because based on this, you have a number of diagnoses which you can make. And there, this could be a complete shadowing, especially like behind these calculi, or it could be a dirty shadowing, I told you, along with the ring down artifacts, it produces a dirty light. It's not a very clean shadow by the gas bubbles. And there is a, this is the edge shadowing, like around the, near the edges of the gallbladder. So these shadows, if you remember, you will, you'll understand what diagnosis you can make. And now coming to the acoustic enhancement, uh, when the ray a sound beam passes through a tissue, here you see through the fluid it passes completely and therefore more number of sound waves pass behind. Therefore you have a brightness uh, behind this and that is called as the post acoustic enhancement. Uh, this is a cystic swelling and this is a fibroadenoma which also gives a slight amount of post acoustic enhancement. Now there is a propagation velocity. Here there is a hemangioma of the liver and this, you would ask me why hemangioma is appearing hyperechoic, but, uh, but instead it could have appeared hypoechoic, though there is presence of blood inside. Uh, basically, ultrasound is about the presence of reflectors. So many blood vessels in the hemangioma, they cause so much reflections and they cause uh, delay of the passage of sound here. It appears hyperechoic and at the same time, the sound waves which go behind come back a little late and therefore you see that it appears like a cut in the diaphragm. Now, the, some features you should know is about the frame rate. Frame rate is at which rate at which the signals get received. A greater depth have lower frame rates, but at higher frequency have high frame rates. Whenever you switch on the color Doppler, it suddenly reduces the frame rate. So therefore, and the image gets blurred. Therefore, to get a good image, you should keep the color box to as minimal size as possible. And there is another feature in the present day machines is the tissue harmonic imaging, which gives you a very soft and clear image. And now coming to the diagnostic uh, ultrasound application, it is the detection and display of acoustic energy from various interfaces in the body to form an image that reveals information about the target structure, composition, and blood flow. This has evolved from the A mode, that is amplitude mode, to the B brightness mode, and to the present day high resolution real time imaging. And we have different modes like A mode, M mode, color Doppler, pulse wave, continuous wave, and so on. 
So this M mode is nothing but a slice of the B mode, which is taken from the B mode and the, where the cursor is placed. And this translates that slice over time. In the color Doppler, the blood vessels which reflect the sound, which move away and towards the transducer, they have different frequencies, and that the and that is captured as color in the in, and is converted into uh, shown as a color. Uh, the blue is away and red towards. There is no uh, nothing to tell you that blue is a vein or red is an artery, but it is just the direction of the flow. And when is when this is put on a uh, X and Y axis, the positive deflection is taken as towards and the negative deflection is taken as away from the transducer. Now to perform a good uh, ultrasound, you should have the knowledge of the no knobs, that is nobology, which is the pertinent knowledge and use of ultrasound equipment to achieve the best settings and applications for the patient care. The selection of the right probe for the right site and right indication is very important. Understand the display on the monitor and interpret. So now, if you look at this uh, uh, control panel, this is a keyboard like with all other machines, what you get. This is the trackball to move the transducer. Then you can freeze the image. Then you can take, these are all to, to take the measurement, calipers to take the measurement and so on. This is the freeze button. And then when you have a B mode, this is the color flow. This is a power Doppler, pulse wave Doppler, continuous wave and the M mode. And then there is a zoom button and which also adjusts the depth and also uh, you can you can uh, uh, change the depth whenever you want it, and uh, you can zoom with the same button. The uh, the B B mode uh, the the this button when you you can use it to adjust the brightness as well. And whenever you are in a different uh, setting, like you are in a color flow or a power pulse wave setting, press the B mode and then everything comes back to the original. And then this is there is one important feature here. This is called the time gain compensation, which I will tell you in the next slide. Now coming to the adjustments of the depth. So you, you can see in this uh, image that there is a lot of uh, wasted ultrasound real estate. You can see this part is not necessary at all. And instead, if you just adjust the depth, which you have seen in this particular slide here, and you see that uh, this is there is uh, this has been adjusted to fill up the whole screen, and then you get the better image. Now coming to this gain, which I said, you just turn the button, overall button, gain button, that is the B mode, which can be used to adjust the brightness as well. So this one, if you turn it all around, you get this image. And here in this particular image, if you do that, it may not be possible to get a proper, uh, make a proper diagnosis. This patient came with abdominal pain and you look at the bladder, you feel there's nothing behind it. This is all fine. But then when you're at, this is the gain, uh, gain, uh, 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 these are all the, uh, this is the time gain compensation and I have just reduced it and uh, brought it to the side. These, these I have taken it a little back and then you can see that calculus coming in the, into focus. So that is how unless you do a certain adjustments, you may not make a correct diagnosis and that is the biggest uh, mistake you would be doing. Now there are some application presets. The present day machines are very easy to handle and you can uh, each, each uh, uh, these presets will uh, take you directly to the frequency, what you want, the depth adjustment, uh, everything comes with that particular uh, mode. And then you can just start off the scan, just pressing these uh, buttons. Now the imaging planes could be uh, like in all other imagings, you have sagittal, frontal, transverse. And in addition, you have in the ultrasound uh, oblique planes that is short and long axis planes. The best part of the ultrasound is that you can hold it in any direction and turn it in any direction till you get an optimum image. And now acoustic window is any place through which you can uh, visualize, but there are some areas where which help in uh, better visualization of the deeper structures. You have through the lower intercostal spaces, you can see the liver, uh, through the liver, you see the kidney, IVC, portal vein, gallbladder and so on. Through the bladder, you see the uterus, ovaries, uh, pelvic uh, POD, etc. Now, coming to some this terminology, you would have come across a hypoechoic, hyperechoic, anechoic, isoechoic. Now, how do you refer this to? So, so the isoechoic refers to the native tissue of that particular area. So, in the upper abdomen, you take it as liver when you are scanning the main organ. So, towards the left, you are taking you talk of the spleen. So you, whichever organ you're referring to, you would talk at iso, uh, uh, isoechoic and then you compare the echoes of the adjacent structures what you are scanning. 
now the choosing the right ultrasound probe is very important so whenever you hold the probe in your hand you first understand what application the machine is being uh, used for how deep are the structures you want to see how big or small of a footprint would you need does it involve a procedure and does it involve a cavity especially pelvic transrectal and these are the different probes this is a linear probe curvy linear phased array or the cardiac probe and this is an all in one uh, butterfly uh, probe uh, which come which can be attached to the mobile uh, and the, and therefore in the coming days it is going to revolutionize the whole clinical examination itself and this is the intracavitatory that is the vaginal probe uh, so remember that high frequency have a better uh, 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 high frequencies have a better visualization but the, but there is a uh, poor penetration and it is a vice versa for the lower frequencies so this is a linear probe so the st shallow structures up to 8 centimeters can be visualized whereas in a curvy linear probe we use it for the abdomen it has a wide tooth to print and you can see the deeper structures this is the phased array probe again the frequency is low in this it has a small footprint so you can use it between the intercostal spaces and you can have visualize the deeper structures and the probe orientation is when you hold uh, the probe in the hand uh, this the, 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 this marker should be on the side wherein you see the logo of the machine so uh, usually it is on the left side for all the probes and the, um, this should be turned towards the left side towards your left side whereas uh, for the cardiac probe it is on the right side and uh, you hold the you hold it similarly you can inverse it if you want if you, whichever way you are used to doing an ultrasound so sometimes with, if there is a confusion you apply some gel over this part and then do the scan so now holding the probe, you all would be familiar with this. So these are the different ways you can hold according to your convenience. And these are the different movements you make like sliding, rocking, rotating, and uh, tilting no movements. So you apply some coupl coupling agents to obliterate the air body interface and develop a maximal acoustic contact. So now coming to interpretation of some images. So now the moment you have uh, put the probe in the right intercost, lower intercostal spaces, you find this uh, through the liver, you see this uh, hepatic veins converging into the, so, send in, into the central vein and to the IVC. So this is called as the bunny sign. And the moment you look at this, look into the IVC and see how well it is collapsing. It gives you so much information about the vascular, uh, the, the status of the patient, whether he's uh, overhydrated, underhydrated, whether he has CCF or whatever. Meanwhile, look, look into the costophrenic angle, whether there's fluid collection there, look at, at the gallbladder, right, right, right kidney, pancreas, and so many structures. Within no time, you, you have ruled out so many things. And on the left side, you, you look at the you know, kidney, spleen, uh, and then in the pelvis, when, uh, see, when you, at the, in the abdominal wall itself, you could see this is the mesh which is being placed. So you follow up this mesh whenever this patient comes to you for a follow-up. You need not ask the radiologist to tell you how my mesh is placed and how well it is it is doing, whether there's a collection underneath, there is a, is it getting folded up, is it getting coiled or whatever. So you can just judge it for yourself. And uh, this slide I've just put up to show the clarity of the present day machines. This is, mine is a little older one though, but present days are even, even better. So this is the, uh, the, uh, the spine. You can see the aorta. This is the IVC. This is the splenoportal junction. You can see the gastroduodenal artery here and the common bile duct. So this is the clarity with which you see. So you can imagine how well you can see the structures within. You just have to spend five minutes for a given patient. And now this particular thing, I call it as fire in the bladder. So this is the, the you keep it uh, and you see even, even if you don't put color, you can still see this urine jet. So this particular thing, if you see, you know that the, both the kidneys are doing well. There is no obstruction. You can even detect the vesicouretic reflex if you spend some time, if you look at this. And uh, suppose you don't see this urine jet. They may not occur simultaneously, but then at least two to three jets per minute are important. If you don't see, or if it is weaker on one side, you know there is an obstruction. So here there is a urine, the ureteric jet, and you can see the calculus here. There is nothing coming out from this side. So you wait for some time, you don't uh, de uh, de detect it at once. And now this patient came with the torsion of the ovary um, and, in, and, and incidentally she had a tor torsion of the appendages epiploica. And uh, looking at this picture, I, I had to, I saw this picture and then uh, uh, she had uh, this, uh, she, this, this, this was something which I had seen, I couldn't really identify what it was. 
But then after looking at this, I went back to the image and I saw this. And that was, uh, then I could correlate what it was. But then uh, the, the books say that this is hyperechoic. The torsion epi, uh, of the epiploica is hyperechoic. But you can see the hematoma in this. And therefore, it is hypoechoic. So this is how a surgeon, if he starts doing ultrasound, can correlate what, in, what he's seeing inside the body. And now this patient came with a... Uh, I, I call this ready to cut patients, means they come with all the reports and they get admitted directly. And you're you are very lucky if you get such patients. This patient came with the last report of 15 days with the cholelithiasis symptomatic and she wanted to get operated. Uh, but then I usually want to see the for the CBD myself. And I just put in the probe, put on the probe on her and I found this, there was something hypoechoic here. I was not very comfortable. I sent her for a CT and it was a pheochromocytoma. So probably that saved me that day. If I had not put it, I had directly taken up, I don't know what uh, possible things would have happened in the OT that day. And this is, uh, incidentally, this patient came for uh, some other problem. And then I found this lesion in the bladder. And uh, on, and on, uh, on tape, we took her up for cystoscopy and did a resection when it was a T1 tumor and we could completely cure this patient on the same day, she, within uh, two, three days, everything was over. That is uh, the beauty of it if the surgeon starts doing ultrasound. And this is fast, all of you would be aware of it. Patient came walking with his father. They just met with an accident very close to a hospital and you can see the liver lacerations. You can see so much of uh, fluid around the spleen. The, then you have this uh, uh, blood clots in the hepatomorrison's pouch and then there are blood clots in the pelvis. Immediately we shifted this patient to a trauma center without any delay. And uh, this was a boy who came to us, 10-year-old boy with a handlebar injury. Uh, and he came walking, just holding his upper abdomen. There was a transection of the head at the neck of the pancreas. Immediately, he was uh, 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 endoscopically, it was corrected and it was uh, patient went home within two days. And this is uh, cholecystitis. You have both a calculus as well as calculus. These patients, a calculus, usually come with severe upper abdominal pain. They come as surgical patients. And the moment you look at this, there is fluid in, in the pelvis and uh, the high fever. You, before you know, the lab report comes, you know this is dengue NS1 antigen positive and patient has thrombocytopenia. And uh, this patient has... Uh, uh, a calculus in the, in the neck of the gallbladder. You can see the thickened gallbladder wall, pericholecystic collection. And uh, another patient, in fact, even the CT had not mentioned it that day that this was a perforated gallbladder. It, was, it just said that cholecystitis empty gallbladder. Then I just to, to, wanted to see it again. So I saw these stones lying outside the gallbladder. So we did, without any delay, we operated on this patient. And this is again cholelithiasis, multiple stones in the CBD and cholangiolytic abscess. And very important for all surgeons is the, are some signs for the gallbladder. I just wanted to add one more. That is the um, after uh, Dr. Ravi Shankar put today's picture, wherein you see the uh, me membrane collapsing into the uh, gallbladder. So I just missed out on that. Anyway, someday I'll share that image also. Uh, this is the sin sign. That is a stone in the next sign. Whenever you see this, never delay, no conservative treatment at all. Do as early as possible because of the distension, the patient may go into gangrene of the gallbladder and land up with generalized peritonitis. And these patients are likely to have Marizis syndrome if there is a long time delay. And these patients, you see here, there's a hypoechoic shadow and this is mistaken for a gallbladder and they say no calculi seen. But in fact, this is a gallbladder studded with calculi. And that is why you're seeing this wall, echo and shadow sign. So this is very important. I have seen a number of patients come with a normal scan and then they are symptomatic and this point is particularly positive and they have a very difficult gallbladder. So with these kind of things, you predict a difficult gallbladder surgery as well. Now, uh, the gut signature is something which you see where you see all the layers of the histological layers of the uh, uh, bubble. And this is a bone for ultrasound. This is probably not seen in any other modality. Here you see the appendix with all these layers and the same thing on the target lesion here. And uh, the, the, this is, these are the different, this is a cataral appendix where you can see all the layers a little more well-defined. This is a fluid-filled appendix, an appendicolith with a fluid, with the fill, appendix filled with fluid as well and free fluid in the pelvis. Now, whenever you see a lumen more than six millimeters or a, a discontinuity of the wall, 
and uh, most of the things sometimes may not get mentioned in all the reports unless you have very good radiologists doing a detailed reporting of the appendix and here you have a discontinuity of the ecogenic submucosal layer and this should never be delayed the appendix may not be looking perforated but these already have a early signs of generalized peritonitis and this is another one where there is distended gallbladder fecalis. all these patients would require an urgent surgery and of course, appendicular mass, you decide whether to operate conservative, depending on the findings. You can do serial scans for these patients. This is an abscess, appendicular abscess. Decide how to drain it and which is the nearest, uh, shortest route which you can get. And then uh, th the advantage of surgeon seeing ultrasound is here. Uh, that is, uh, we, this was the patient who came with generalized peritonitis and we did an appendicectomy before the ultrasound. That uh, I could see something whitish here. I couldn't correlate what it was. It wasn't even looking like a fecolith. It was a fish thorn which had perforated and given a, led to generalized peritonitis. And then this is a liver abscess. Again, needs follow-up. So you repeated ultrasound, do it every day without charging even. And then it is for the benefit of the patient and both of you can have a very good uh, uh, relationship the entire life. The patient will be so grateful to you because you have taken utmost care to see when you have to drain it or sometimes you, as you follow up, you may see it resolving also. And this is the hydrated cyst liver. All of you must, are very familiar with this picture. And then acute pancreatitis. Uh, you can see the peripancreatic collection within no time before even send the amylase, you know all these are with you. The patient comes in, you put the probe on the abdomen and it is there. And this is the pre-fluid. Incidentally, this is a, this patient also had a femoral vein thrombosis. And depending on the amount of fluid, you know how severe his pancreatitis could be, and you can start your treatment accordingly. And this is the pancreas with the studded with the, the calcula in the duct. This is the pancreatic. The, this is calcification in the pancreatic head, and this is a hugely dilated pancreatic duct. This is a large pancreatic pseudocyst. Now the KUB region gives you a very good, uh, very very good images, and this is the large calculus in the renal pelvis, multiple calcula in the kidney. Then then the hydronephrosis. You trace it down. You coming down again. You have the calculus there, and then at the vesicouretic junction there is a calculus. If you look at this picture and you see this edema, probably this stone is not going to pass down. It would require an EURS. Then a bladder uh, neck obstruction with multiple diverticuli. And this is the large renal cyst, categorize it. And then if there is no need for further investigation in this particular patient, you can just follow it up or surgery, depending upon the size and the patient's symptoms. And simple ascites, portal vein with ascites, you can see the bowel loops floating and a malignant ascites, you can see the deposits on the ovaries. And this is the peritoneal deposits. Before even sending for cytology, you already know in the first clinical examination itself that this patient has all this and you can not waste the patient's time. Fibroadenoma, wider than taller. And uh, then this is a taller than wider malignancy. Most important is you can do a biopsy, save the images for medical legal purposes that you have taken up, true cut biopsy in the right plate. And thyroid swellings, immediately you know which one to be investigated, which to do FNAC. This is a malignancy, this is papillary carcinoma of the thyroid. Now, certain tips are whenever possible, use the highest frequency, a smallest field. Uh, will give you a better resolution with low, loss, less frame rate. So you use the small, you can choose that depth and uh, the small amount of uh, field also you can choose. Use the proper focal rent, uh, focal zone at the relevant depth. And there are post-processing options, like I told you, adjusting uh, the gain. Use tissue harmonics to reduce artifacts and do not hesitate, throw some color like this uh, and trying to save it for a later date or next time and so on. So to summarize, for image optimization, we have a we should have a thorough clinical knowledge of what, why, and what is the physiological and pathological process going on. A technical skill uh, is important to get the relevant images, uh, to understand the artifacts, and to avoid the pitfalls. And the knowledge of the technical skill, uh, to making the most of the equipment, is also important. And since US is ultrasound is operator dependent, the person behind the machine is more important than the machine itself. And a knowledgeable, well-trained operator performing on a low-tech piece is better than a poorly performed scan on the latest high-tech machine. And the biggest limitation is not the machine. It is the operator who lacks the knowledge of the pathologies he or she can detect. And a fear of facing problems uh, after an incorrect ultrasound diagnosis precludes many of us from learning ultrasound. And a surgeon 
remember, has the advantage of seeing before and seeing it again during surgery. So a little about my journey. So I started my practice in a very small place near hospital and we had the nearest uh, uh, place we had to send was to a radiologist was Ballari. But then most of the patient would never turn back. And it was once so happened that I wrongly operated on a, opened up a patient thinking it was appendicitis, but she had a hemoperitoneum. And then overnight, the patient had to rush to down, get it to bring blood. Her, her attender, in fact, went in a lorry to bring, bring blood. And then th that was the time I realized that I should be having an ultrasound and start myself. The training, I, there are not many the training centers there. And more than training centers, we did not have the people to communicate as how to go about it to get the training. So I took the training, uh, I met Dr. Hegde from uh, Daan who was the HOD of uh, radiology and requested him to allow me to go to Bapuji radiology department. And under Dr. Pramod Shetty, I could get some, get to see something. And I went there for 15 days. And most of it was reading, learning. And the, for the first few months, I did a free ultrasound for everybody who came. And that is how I started learning. And even today, when I do an ultrasound, if I feel my image is not good enough or my diagnosis is not satisfactory, I return the money, send them to a radiologist after I do a complete scan and then do it. So that I learn it again and I, I, I do not have the fear of getting giving a wrong report. It means most of the time I don't do it, but whenever I, I have to, if I want a second opinion, I don't make, I don't uh, tax the patient. I send them again and uh, give them two opinion, uh, the advantage of two opinions. And uh, the problem with that was uh, the, the PCP entity, as you know, is the biggest uh, hurdle nowadays. But then those days, it, though it started in 1994, it was not so strict. The DHO used to come and those people who used to give the machine themselves used to get us a license. Uh, but then over time, it has become more strict. And uh, the radiologists also opposed us to sonologists doing the ultrasound. So we they all wanted to give us a degree, some some authentication that these people can do ultrasound. And we had a, a, a CBT, that is competence-based test for those people uh, doing ultrasound up to 2014. And then we started, uh, we, we had to give the exam in 2018 and there were only two attempts kept. And uh, luckily I could refer, get through in the first attempt. And that's how I do not have any fear of a, some medical legal thing happening now. So unless our department through something starts some training courses and some accreditation programs, I think uh, ultrasound again, the PCP entity is still going to uh, uh, be a problem. And uh, we, we as surgeons should show the need for ultrasound if, during clinical examinations and for, forward. And uh, with handheld machines, I think the time is going to change and we should be ready for this change. But because undergraduates are going to learn ultrasound. So I think postgraduates must be learning ultrasound. Postgraduates and all the MS students, the MS candidates should be learning ultrasound in the coming days. And this is a poem which I had uh, written about uh, uh, ultrasound that is unveiling of the Pandora's box in, in, which is published in the Indian Journal of Surgery. Some of my references. And just to read this, that is the gray color, which is blurred. Though the gray color represents something very dull and uninteresting, a proper utilization of the different shades has been a major breakthrough in the cure of diseases through their diagnostic implications. That was written by me. Thank you for this opportunity and thank you all for the patient here. Thank you, Dr. Nas. Thank you, sir. So, so, you have to unmute. Sorry, sorry. Uh, madam, it was a super lucid presentation. Thanks. And you have covered everything and the uh, pictures were uh, just amazing and uh, very informative. There are a few uh, questions on the chat box. I'll just go through them. Yes, uh, Dr. Raj Gopal Chennai has uh, asked about the IVC, standard uh, IVC uh, uh, diameter. How does it reflect the shock? Um, Dr. Nas, you can stop sharing. Okay, sir. So that Sophie Mutt can. Yes, sir. Okay. So will, you, will I answer it now or after the sir, sir's presentation, sir? No, no, Madam, no, we no. Can, Madam, we can finish it now because yes, uh, yes. sir's presentation is again, uh, it's a yes. totally different topic. So the, so the IVC, okay. not overlap. So the IVC diameter is different for different countries. Usually it is taken between 1.8 to 2.1 centimeters. 
So from the IVC diameter, depending on the collapsibility, whether it is 50%, more than 50% or less than 50%. So depending on the collapsibility, you can judge the pressure in the IVC. So if you take it as, and uh, then even in ventilated patients, you have this uh, collapsibility index, index. Based on that, you can uh, assess. So you see the uh, picture uh, thing, uh, IVC, you put, put the M mode and measure the diameter during inspiration and during expiration. And in one frame itself, you'll get it. And then you see how much is the collapsibility. You can just calculate it, minus and get it. And within a minute, you know that this patient, if it is not collapsing at all. So because just the two days back, one patient had come to me with, the, uh, say, patient had the alcoholic cirrhosis of liver. So I put the probe and I was guaranteed that it was a cirrhosis of liver. But no, it wasn't. He had an IVC of 2.5 centimeters and it was not collapsing. It was then I directly sent him to the physician. His ejection fraction was just 20. So within moments, you know that this is a medical case or surgical case, the moment you keep the probe without any wastage of time. So that is how you can. Thank you. And uh, another question is from Dr. Chirajeevi Gowda. Uh, how was the pancreatic transaction was uh, corrected by endoscopically? Just uh, MPD stenting would suffice with that. Yeah, they did and they did just a stenting. Immediately he, before he developed generalized peritonitis, I, he came within minutes of his fall. Well, he had fallen somewhere around the hospital. He came there and and at within about two hours he was shifted to Hubli, and there he was stented. And uh, the, uh, and I I was looking for those images, stented images which they had sent. And somehow I didn't get them. So, but then uh, they called me up after two days and said the patient is being discharged. He came back to me and it was fine. Dr. Shivram, uh, sir, uh, has uh, some questions on the chat box. Should the elective ultrasound be, uh, the, be in fasting or what? Uh, sir, most of the patients, when by the time they come to us, is around four to five hours. And I rarely see an empty gallbladder in, in these patients. If at all I see if the scan is not satisfactory, I call them the next day morning. But most of the time, by the time they come to our hospital, they have to travel certain distance, wait for us. And the, the period of four to six hours is already done. So not all ultrasounds we do on fasting stay. If not satisfactory, we call them the next day. And uh, ultrasound interpretation is operator dependent. Your comments, yes. sir, has asked. You have already commented. That was fine. The, who is the licensing authority to give the permission for the surgeons? Any so idea? So far, uh, so far I, I cannot answer this question, sir, because <laughs> I think so. It's difficult to answer. Anybody can't answer this. Unless the whole association shows that goes and approaches and says that we should we should be doing ultrasound. That happens only if we have if we start training and get understanding what we need. We have to show them what we need. Okay, excellent. And uh, a lot of people have congratulated you on the excellent presentation, madam. Yes, thank uh, you. USG is the extension of clinical examination. Of course, it is. Presently, how can a surgeon get the accreditation of doing ultrasound? Is there any uh, form how you can get uh, accreditation for ultrasound, madam? Anything? No, no. Presently, it is not there. So, till 2018, after that exam was there, if at all somebody was doing, they could have passed that time. But now uh, it is it is not there. But for endo ultrasound, all this we have to spe take special permissions and do it. And uh, unless we approach the authority, uh, I, I we have to go about it. So the, the seniors in the association will have to take this forward, and uh, we have to get it for us. We have to literally fight it. We have a fight to uh, take. Madam, uh, just briefly about the fast and e-fast. Any uh, details? Uh... Shortly, can you just, uh, within a few minutes, can you just cover? Yes. So for the fast, we do mainly for the abdomen, that is for the right intercostal spaces. You uh, you see the liver, the hepatomorrison's pouch. Basically, you look at the presence of fluid in the abdomen. And uh, on the left side, you look through the spleen. At the same time, you'll be assessing the solid organs and you come down to the pelvis. For the E-fast, you, you look at the costophrenic angles, assess the presence of fluid in the lungs and put a probe in the subcostal region and look at the fluid with the presence of fluid in the pericardium, pericardium. Fine, madam. Any specific type of ultrasound machine to begin with? So the, Dr. Sangmish wants to know. Sir, uh, that depends on what. So there are some machines which are mainly for obstetrics and some of them, they start telling you, you we have 4D, 3D. And those, all those things are really not necessary for, uh, for us. They are mainly for the obstetricians who want to give uh, images of the babies and all. 
uh, in fetus. But otherwise, it is uh, the, the what the machine is between, up to twenty lakhs. I think you can get a good ultrasound machine, fifteen to twenty lakhs. So Fine, madam. Thank you. Comfortable with. Thank you, madam. I think so. We'll uh, go with. Uh... It was an excellent presentation. Um, I think so. Everybody acknowledges me with this. Yes. I request uh, now Dr. Sopimat to please uh, present uh, his presentation on endoscopy. As I've already introduced him, he needs no introduction. Sir, uh, you're there. Can you just share your yeah, slides? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll just uh, start sharing the slide. I hope it is seen. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah, clear, sir. Yeah, not clear. Yeah. So, thank you, Dr. Hepsur. And uh, first, uh, let me compliment and congratulate the KCSI for this wonderful programs. And uh, they make us work a little more and encourage the youngsters and many people who are interested in this field. And I cannot talk about endoscopy or laparoscopy without taking the names of my teachers who have inspired me to take up this specialty. Professor Srikande, Dr. Nande, and Dr. Amit Maidev, whom we all know that they are surgeons. This is just about a little history that I just wanted to mention, that we know all these big names who have contributed for the development and growth of endoscopy right from the beginning of early 18th century. Only the blue line, the blue colored fonts, the names are physicians. Rest all surgeons, you know all the big names in this, right from those who cannulated, who removed the stone, Rich later that Philip Bozini and all these people you know, Suhendra, who is well-known name again. And of course, the recent one is of our own Dr. Rao, who made name in the internationally in notes. And of course, Inoi, who developed this poem for Achilles Cardia. So these are all big names who all belong to the surgical field. And now the question is, this is a frequently asked question, who should do endoscopy? Should a surgeon do endoscopy? Should a medical gastroenterologist do endoscopy or should a physician do endoscopy? Well, it's just like asking question. I remember that once Dr. Arunbal said that when he was asked who should do a diabetic food dressing, he said, anybody who has passion for wound healing should do the diabetic food wound dressing. Like that. Similarly here, anybody who has passion for this endoscopy and to treat should do endoscopy with exposure to that. And why should surgeon do endoscopy? Well, as there are many reports to say this is a critical adjunct to surgery, and in America at least, the many of the rural surgeons are doing endoscopy. In fact, they're the primary caregivers as far as endoscopy is concerned, even in Canada. And even in many rural places, all these places, they are the ones who are giving the endoscopic services, including in Europe, America, and Canada, and all that. How does it help? Well, you can definitely make a good preoperative diagnosis and quality of therapy will definitely improve. And it will help us to make a balanced decisions in the therapy and management. And many times intraoperative endoscopy we do, which are very in difficult situations and all that. And postoperatively, of course, we can handle the complications and therapy, etc. This is from Inoi, who did uh, uh, this poem, Achalasia Cardia, who developed this, as I mentioned. And he says this that it is essential that we see the lumen from inside also. As a surgeon, they see from outside. We need to see from inside to make a proper decision. And again, as we have seen that many of the surgical procedures are being replaced by the endoscopic procedures. And if the surgeons don't learn this endoscopic procedure, I think we lose out many things of handling this and we lose out the experience and we're unable to treat the future surgeons in handling these things. But why did the surgeons stop doing endoscopy, those who contributed so much? Because they didn't find it as exciting as they do the surgeries in those days. They thought that it's just for a diagnosis and they never foresaw that it will grow by leaps and bounds. And timing and the time pressure has been always there, even now. And work pressure, because you don't know when you start a surgery, when you'll be free. And you don't like to face the patients confronting you that they have been on empty stomach and you have been not been able to attend to them. And as I said, nobody thought that it will grow so much. And changing dynamics, of course, a bit sensitive about things and other challenges, I think, uh, because it's a YouTube live, I think better I don't make comments about this. But I think many people are experienced what is happening, why the surgeons are stopping doing endoscopy. 
Well, this is the American Board of Surgery where this is part of the curriculum of surgery. And they have to go through a different level of training right from first year to the last year. That is how when they come out, they are fully trained endoscopists. But unfortunately, that is not so with us. Even in Canada, this is there. And in Europe also it is there, though it is dwindling. But in, unfortunately, in India, what has happened is the earlier MCI, this is from the earlier MCI website and the guidelines where it mentioned about the therapeutic and diagnostic endoscopic procedure should be part of the MS curriculum. This is the older version. And this is a new version which has come up in NMC website. It is screenshots are taken from the new NMC guidelines. Now it is limited to only one sentence, management of bile duct stones, including endoscopic open and laparoscopic management. I do not know how one can manage endoscopically the CBD stones if they do not know basics of endoscopy. And that's out of the curriculum now, unfortunately. Well, as far as diagnosis is concerned, there are so many lesions which are likely to pick up. I'm not going to narrate them because that the short of time, but the number is too huge what we can pick up. I'm just going to just run through the list and you can go through that. It's phenomenal pathology is what you pick up by endoscopy. You can consider it as just an extension of the clinical examination, just like sonography, as Dr. Naz mentioned in our wonderful presentation. Endoscopy can be just an extension of clinical examination in, in any abdominal pathology or chest pathology for that matter. And it will give an immense value. In stomach, these are all the diagnoses what you can pick up. So many pathologies will pick up whenever they come out with a problem. And duodenum, these are all the diagnosis problems that what you can pick up in that. And again, in colon, so many things. We miss out all these things if we don't do endoscopy. We don't see them. We don't diagnose them. We don't pick up them. And this about ERCP. And bronchoscopy, again, many of the lesions are missed out just because we don't do bronchoscopy whenever it is indicated because we don't do it. Earlier, of course, surgeons were doing it regularly. And therapy, again, there is sky is the limit what a surgeon can do. Right from foreign bodies, diverticula, bleeds, hiatus hernia, leomyomas, post op structures, achalasia, perforations, just too many, too many what we can do. And palliative, RT placement, stents. In stomach, again, it may be hiatus hernia treatment, which is now picking up again. Bleeds, polyps, peg placement, which is very, very simple. Cheap OIM, perforations, ward of necrosis, pseudosis, gastrogenostomy is being done. Direct procedure is being done, like balloon placement and all that, palliative stenting, and endoscopic hepaticogastrostomy now is coming up in a big way. And these are all the things, again, what you can do in duodenum. And this is just a list that what I'm giving, what all you can do, even in lower J, the perforations can be treated. And there are through the scope clips, over the scope clips, so many things have developed. Post-op leaks, you can tackle them with just a stenting and other things. Derotation of the all this uh, can be done, volvulus and other things. Malignancy mapping has become a very, very important thing. Many times the people send us for a mapping, the location, the extent, and the mucosal involvement. And palliative stenting, again, is very, very, very useful thing, what you can say. Again, in bronchoscopy, we can do so many therapeutic procedures, which, you know, that once you become used with a diagnostic thing, then one can go with the progress uh, to the therapeutic procedures. And it's a phenomenal thing what we can do. And of course, now endoscopic ultrasound has come, which helps largely in assessing nodes whether metastasis, what it is and all that. CBD stones, which cannot be picked up, it's supposed to be more sensitive than what we do MRCP. Biliary drainage, guided needle biopsy, guided aspirations. Now for chemotherapy malignants, which cannot be uh, operated, a histological diagnosis is essential in that it is of great value, like pancreas, et cetera, and all that. And post-op interventions can be done whenever there are complications. Entroscopy has come in again in a big way where you can take the assess the structures or their mucosal ulcer, lesions are there. You can arrest the bleed, foreign bodies can be removed. And of course, spy glass has changed the whole scenario of management of CBD stones now. Of course, as not only assessment, the structures, the lesions, which you cannot see, you can literally enter into the CBD and see this all pathologies and take a biopsy and come back. And what is new is coming is a cooperative surgery where the laparoscopic surgeons do and endoscopists help operatively. They put in a scope and guide the laparoscopic surgeons to do surgery. So it has become more of endoscopic and laparoscopic surgeons doing together or even open surgery. This is called as cooperative surgery is picking up a lot. And what we are seeing that polycystitis, gastrogenostomy, and apatis are a surgical patient, even we are losing out. For example, cholecystogenostomies are being done, cholecystoduodenostomies are being done. 
gastro jejunostomies are being done endoscopically and appendicitis yes appendicitis are being treated endoscopically this is a recent rct which has come in a appendicitis treatment of course in a select group of patients which are filtered out and all that it's not that complicated it's all that non complicated appendicitis endoscopic treatment i don't know what all will come tomorrow and surgeons will stop treating these also and if you don't do pick up the endoscopic skills i think will be nowhere we need to uh, train our people and there are so many diagnostic pick up what we can do as i mentioned this some you can if you don't the endoscopy i don't think anybody can see a lesion like this very early lesion of the esophageal ca what you can see here i don't think this kind of lesions can be seen unless you start doing endoscopy yourself and lesions can be picked up very very early especially in problem you we see that lot many patients coming with the uh, advanced lesions but unless you do you can't pick up these are all bronchoscopic findings where a single tubercle like this you can pick up and these are all tuberculous lesions tuberculous destroyed and this all turned out to be tuberculous easily picked up malignancies bronchus all that you can see and rare diseases only you will be able to pick up rare diseases like colorectal cox this turned out to be both the patients is a very young patient you can see that she just a 14 years girl and this of course is a elderly patient where malignancy was suspected but turned out to be uh, uh, um, uh, cox a benign pathology this is a mediastinal tuberculosis which has ruptured into bronchus and presented as hemoptysis you can see the nodal tissue coming out that and biopsy proved these are all very very rare cases and you won't be able to make out that unless you develop this is again a mediastinal cold abscess which had ruptured into esophagus the biopsy proved that it is tuberculosis again and simple therapy we can all undertake a simple procedure like this what you can see it's the pseudocyst of the pancreas where you don't need any much gadgets and very very simple to do you can just put in a balloon over the guide wire puncture it and dilate that with a balloon and well you see that endoscopically created you see a cystogastrostomy in this a nicely created an endoscopic cystogastrostomy where you don't have to do anything everything gets screened so this is a fantastic process like a simple polypectomy lower gi bleed so you can just do a inject there it's the most simplest procedures what you can do and the you can easily take up the polyp and then of course very clean thing what you can see so these all things can be and very rare, rare diseases where it's a dilophize where there is no ulcer but bleed is there difficult to pick up unless you suspect and look for it because if they stop bleeding when you do the procedure you miss out them same thing happened with this patient which was a dilophize in the rectum which can be simply clipped or they can be injected and you can just do the therapy and surgical experience will definitely help you because we are all surgeons we have been doing this and in decision making for example we don't get scared because of these bleeds and we know that they can tackle them so actively bleeds who won't settle with all the therapy we take them immediately the next day and just inject the glue and of course they can be arrested immediately it's a dramatic result and patients start recovering immediately after that so this all can be done with us here again is a foreign body where we impacted perforated foreign body and after that of course we treat conservatively you can see that it's been cleared off with a marine you can see the perforation with a local abscess can be treated conservatively but we know how to manipulate and treat take them out here of course it was perforated and we had to go in with surgery immediately and emergency management of course it helps like bleeds you know forest class you can we all know where there is a high risk patient it's elderly patient and there is a visible vessel and just inject them surrounding that with a saline adrenaline of course it can be combined with the bicap and not only the rebleed chances comes down and effectively you will be able to send on these patients early so even this can be done earlier and of course we all know what happens when the bleed fails in this as you see that the therapy failed of course they can be clipping and all is been done but when the field is not clear better that these patients are taken up for surgery immediately and life can be saved when you just go and like it is bleeding vessels so all these things can be done as a surgeon and even during surgery you know these is just called as mapping what i was mentioning for example in this we know that this is involving the lesser curvature and there is no lesser curvature available to us for a subtotal gastrectomy or lower radical gastrectomy this patient has to go for a total radical gastrectomy this is what is called as endoscopic mapping if this example again upper ja bleed this is a hemosuccus pancreatitis when you did a ct we saw that this is a bleed inside the cyst was there immediately patient was taken for surgery with this and we did this all distal pancreatectomy 
because it's the whole thing was a mask. We had to take a part of the stomach, distal pancreas, and the spleen. And this is a operative image. This is a pancreas, this is a stomach wall, and this is an aneurysm, and this is the bleed surrounding that, and this is the spleen, what you can see. So all these things we can do. And we can really, really have a comprehensive holistic approach and take a balanced decision. For example, whenever gallstone pancreas comes, if they don't settle, immediately you go in next day, why the patient is not settling. And it's a very simple, just put a needle cut on this impacted stone, the stone will get released. And you see the kind of bile, what it comes out after that, it's an infected bile. So you can see the amount of cholangitis and the infected bile coming out. These patients settle rapidly rather than, and also the further damage will be prevented. Then of course you can handle further. And again, these cholangitis patients, you can handle it, they are septic and all that. And you can comfortably do the ER6 process. You can see the purulent bile coming out, clear of all that and clear the stone. And once you clear the stone, then you can go inside and see what is happening also. For example, in this patient, we'll be able to see the inside the CBD to make sure that you are cleared of the stones, like this, as you can see again. So these are all the things what we as surgeons can do and do it. For example, if there is lower CBD narrowing, in this, what we do is we do a balloon spintroplasty because we cannot pull out the bigger stone through that because the lower CBD will be narrow and then pull out a stone. It is simple. This is again is a diverticula and a papilla is here, difficult cannulation. What to do? Just do a pre-cut in this. Of course, it's risky in diverticulas, but with a careful thing, you can do the pre-cut and do the cannulation and then deliver the stone. So these all as a surgeons, you will be more confident in doing these process and you'll be able to do this. Whenever you feel, of course, mechanical, especially post-cholestectomy, mm -hmm. what to do is a mechanical tree. We break the stone with this mechanical tree, and then we take up the stone. This is how we do this. And we also know that if, suppose if it's a mirizi, we cannot pull out this stone. You have to just put in a stent as here and go in laparoscopically and take it off within a day or two once the cholangitis settles. This is a patient, you can see the ICD, tube, sorry, uh, a chest drainage tube here. This is a pancreatic pseudocyst. This is a pancreatitis, pancreatic duct. It has given off, it's leaked. Sir, and then you strike sir, it. Sir. And then after that, once the sir, patient settles, clear, the patient no? will settle. Okay. Then you can take them for surgery. Like this is a pancreatic genostomy. This is a ductal disruption, what is shown here. And you do a pancreatic genostomy, the disease is treated. Everything is taken care. This is what you can do. Even in bronchoscopy, when you see a bleed from a segment of a bronchus, you know which exactly the segment you need to resect when you go in. So this is how it helps in a thoracic surgery. You know that there is an active bleed coming from here. We just go in, take out this apico posterior segment, and you are done. That's all. Very, very simple, and it helps you. And surgical intrusion does sometimes does help us. For example, this patient was diagnosed as a malignancy, bronchogenic malignancy, based on this typical chest X-ray finding. This is what has been a teaching standard, like the sun ray experience, appearance, everything, and all that, what you see. But when we went in in this patient, this is the finding. We know that this is not malignancy. By the look, and when the biopsy was taken, this turned out to be Cox. Other patient who presented to this, Suggested as a malignancy. In fact, bias came. He came for surgery. There is esophageal thickening in the CT. Bias had come as squamous cell carcinoma. But when we went in, when he had come for surgery, then we saw that it is something different. It, it didn't look like a malignancy. A very old video. You see this. This not look. Doesn't look like a malignancy. We repeated a deeper biopsy. Sent it for HBR. It came as tuberculosis, and we treated. Put them on the anticox. You see how nicely it has been healed, and you can see the scarring because of tuberculosis here. And these are all something, major surgery saved and the patient is also saved. You can have it because we surgeons are all gifted with the creative thinking. Whenever you know the difficult situation here, you cannot see the papilla properly. There was a stone cholangitis. What we did, we just snared that papilla off. And then of course we could enter the bile duct and then we could treat this patient because literally there is no, it's a flat papilla, difficult cannulation. Once the papilla is snared, then you could go in. So this is how you can, have an innovative thing and do as a surgeon many things which otherwise possibly will not be able to do. And this is another patient where the patient had a severe cough and you can see that there is a haziness after cough infection. And on CT, you can see that there's a severe mediastinitis, everything, air, gas, everything, abscess there. What we did, we just went in endoscopically, but we saw that there is a perforation and this patient underwent endotherapy without any surgery. How we did it? We went inside, 
and did a debridement through the perforation. What to say as a perforative opening in there? We went inside this mediastinal cavity, did the debridement. We did publish this, and you can see that there is a cavity here. And as a surgeon, we know when to do, when to stop. Suppose if there is a problem, how to intervene? This is a mediastinal abscess cavity, debrided thoroughly, washed, put in a rice tube there as a drainage, kept on washing, put the patient on a uh, yes, peg feeding, and this rice tube washings, everything and all that. And patient came for follow-up, you see that everything is healed. This is healed, everything. And the perforation is healed, the patient went back. And this we published. This other patient who came, and this is a follow-up, sorry. Uh, this is a follow-up, the same patient, how everything has got cleared, you can see. This is a pre-operative, this is post-operative. This is pre-operative, this is post-operative. Other patient again came, it was thought as a myocardial infection because of severe chest pain, thrombolysis, etc. did not improve, counts went high. That's when the chest uh, x-ray showed that there's a haziness here. But, and you can see the chest expresses all this kind of air, abscess formation, all that. That is when, this is how the chest CT and everything appeared. When we went in, what we saw for our surprise is this a perforation. How it happened, the patient doesn't know. Pure waste here. Both side perforations of the esophagus, which was coming out. What we did, we placed peg for a nutrition. You can see the other side perforation also, this side perforation, placed peg placement for nutrition and just went in retrosternally, this is a peg placement, retrosternally and drained this all mediastinal collection because there was no pleural collection. It was mainly in the mediastinum. We just debride the whole mediastinum. You can see the drain being placed in the mediastinum through this infrasternal root and the patient recovered completely and retreated. And this is of course in the post-op when you came for follow-up, there is a scarred esophagus, but everything is healed nicely. So this is what, as a surgeon, you can take initiative and do so many things. This patient, the stent had migrated. There's a lower CBD stone, cholangitis, sepsis, and all that. You cannot pull out the stone. You cannot take out the stent. In severe, we have to save the patients. What we did, we pushed in another stent by that time. The cholangitis settled. Then we took the patient for surgery later on. So this is how we can plan. This other patient, this is not to blame anyone. This was, you know, that went to the place, uh, highest, you know, the standard centers for a recurrent abdominal pain. How cities have been, this is November 2019. You can see the date, September, two, three months, patient has been going on there. They went on doing CT, but nothing else. It's a young patient. We did suspect a pancreatic division, and this turned out to be pancreatic division. And we did a minor ductal papillotomy, and we placed a pancreatic ductal, minor ductal stenting. This, of course, is difficult, but it's not something which is impossible. As surgeons, you can easily do it. This other patient where CBD stenting was done in 2000, again in a bigger center, again re-stenting, removal, again double touching, but nobody advised surgery because it was never handled by surgeon. So you can see that there was cholangitic abscesses, CBD stones cleared, everything is being done, but no surgery was advised. Ultimately, patient came to Hubli for treatment from a bigger center. We just removed these both pigtail stents because the cholangitic abscess were there because of perforation inside, and we placed a fresh stent. Then we did a surgery. So all these things as a surgeon you can do. We can manage our own complications. For example, here when doing a fundic uh, uh, glue injection, this patient started suddenly bleeding because uh, somehow there was some error. And when I was testing it, it just went in there and it started bleeding suddenly because it created a puncture. Well, the team is prepared, you are prepared, you re-glue that same thing and it can be done and everything can be arrested later on. So this is how you re-glue it, test it, everything is done and you can handle it peacefully and nicely. And this other patient where you know that hemorrhoidectomy has been done but bleeding continues but patient had a polyp. After polypectomy, this patient had a bleed as you can see here. We tried to arrest it to the injection, it didn't help. Then what we did, we just simply placed a clip there and everything is arrested. So this as a surgeon, so many things are available to us. This is a peg which got migrated. This is a pinhole in the stomach wall. You don't see a peg tube here. It has migrated out of the stomach wall. How to take it off? Well, again, it was something which we thought at that moment only. What we did, we did radiate cuts were given on that, the peg tube, as in this with a needle. Uh, what we do, the needle cut. Then the peg was pushed inside, and that's how it came inside after radial cuts at different two, three places. And this is how it was repositioned after that. So all these things as a surgeon you can do. And you can definitely do this again, a post-artist structure. 
when you try to dilate, there was a perforation, of course, in my own hands only. You can see the perforation there. As you can see, this is the perforation. It's a bronchus. And what we did, immediately we placed a stent. And when the place came for follow-up, you can see that nice stent is nice and cleared. Everything is there. Stent is in place. And patient was doing quite well. A good pal. You can see the perforation here through the stent here in this area, the bronchus. And we went into the bronchus and you see the stent nicely sitting here. At the curve. So this our patient is so comfortable. He was so happy. And you can do all these things. Post-operative again, you can see this a way patient who was very dyspnea became respiratory problem. I had undergone a spine surgery. I can see the fixation here. What would you do? It? It's a left side was totally collapsed, as you can see here, full of thick mucus, pus, plug, everything. You can see the left side thing. And we, after that, you can see the result here. Everything is clear in the same patient. So it's a wonderful thing what you can do. This patient, we had undergone polycystectomy, referred here for a leak, continued leak, because, and when we went in, there was a gas piece inside, which was left, which had gone into the duodenum. And we just pulled it out and the patient settled. So many things. This patient had undergone hysterectomy. And when patient had significant weight loss, bowel problems, everything, then it was referred to us. What you see here, it's a big mop in the colon, which was being removed. And after the patient did extremely well. Of course, don't ask me how did you handle the other situations in this are medical legal issues. And this is my own case where I had done a trans resection. Patient had a leak after anastomosis. You can see the collection here, everything. And there is a leak here. We did counsel the patient. He had two options, either a laparotomy, do a colostomy, or a stenting with a PCD with pros and cons. He opted for stenting and uh, uh, rectal stenting and other things. And what we did, we did a rectal stenting in the same patient and did a PCD for the collection removal. This is the anastomotic site which had leaked and we placed a stent there and everything settled after that. So that's the stent which is being placed. And this is what you can see in the follow-up. After three months, the stent was pulled off from this. Everything had healed and patient was doing well. So this is how as a surgeon, you can do so many things. There is no limit. The cyclage which was I had dilated and there was a perforation here, as you can see, there is a leak. And immediately we could diagnose it because the patient was complaining of intense pain, balloon dilation. And immediately we had to take it off for surgery. If it is somebody else, then the delay reference will be there. By the time you go in, it may not be so clean. Patient did extremely well. It's a post-op images. Within 24 hours, the patient could be operated. This is how we plan to do this. So this is, I think, should be the mindset that with which we should go and we should inculcate all this in our practice and learn something. And surgeon today, he is lost in this super specialty on that. But what we still feel is a good general surgical training with a basic laparoscopy, basic endoscopy and ultrasound, what Dr. Naz has mentioned. We, we can do wonders in the society today as far as service is concerned, both rural and in urban area. And this was somewhere way back, I think 1997 report, where it says that the endoscopy is much easier than putting in a central line or doing a feeding telgenostomy. And all over the world, surgical residents are required to learn endoscopy. Special abdominals expected to adapt therapeutic procedures and all that. And the term surgeon endoscopist is a legitimate entity. This 1997. But what has happened after that? We have lost the ground. It was there. It's there. So my request to all of us here, to seniors, even if you are not doing endoscopy in your departments or around you, please encourage the youngsters to take up this endoscopy. And then surgeons, please do not miss out this opportunity to learn now. Otherwise, you'll miss out a big thing in your life. And postgraduates, if they're exposed to endoscopy during MS curriculum, they don't need any extra credentialing in doing endoscopy. It can be easily done. They don't need any extra credentialing. If they're exposed during MS that they have assisted, they have done endoscopies and all that, I think that's it. I think we all need to learn and practice, put our mind with this. I'm sorry if I hurried because I didn't want to overshoot the time. Uh, if there are any questions I am willing to take, my sincere request to everyone to encourage, promote, 
and learn this art of endoscopy because now we are fag end at the fag end of the our career but i feel that all our youngsters should take up this and um, sky is the limit that's what i can say with this i think if there are any questions or suggestions i am willing to take uh, thank you sir it was a very very awesome presentation and i think so uh, there are no words which can describe your uh, uh, wonderful presentation and that's how i don't see any uh, questions on the chat box also because you have been very clear about every step and every thing uh, only one thing what uh, there has been a question is any certified uh, endoscopic training centers well what i would suggest is that there are no or uh, any training centers for that matter they can guide you but skills you have to learn on your own but hand holding they can do initial but that is not a credentialing for you see you cannot take that as yes i have learned endoscopy and i'll start doing but that is to guide you to start after that i think you should plan you should plan endoscopies under somebody supervision start doing at least diagnostic slowly progress i think nobody will question you maintain a log book what all you are doing and you suppose if there is a problem you, you go and learn with somebody or call them to assist you you know many people are learning poems and all that how do they learn because some mentor comes and teaches them and they maintain a log book they have learned from them that's enough that's all nothing else because there is no special degree in endoscopy as of now anybody who is interested who is exposed can do endoscopy to the information of everybody everybody i would like to tell our past chairman uh, dr b n patil was a student of uh, dr sophie mart's training program and uh, every day he does about 8 to 10 endoscopies every day many He's, people i think they have progressed almost, to therapeutic procedures also yeah. it's almost uh, 20 years i think so he has been doing it and uh, many others are there and so also our uh, past immediate past uh, president of uh, asi dr siddesh sir he, he was again a pioneer in uh, he was a pioneer in uh, endoscopy in uh, mysore i remember it was in uh, 8590s i have seen that sir was uh, started endoscopy and it was uh, every day he was in that endoscopy room and he used to do so many endoscopies which was amazing and i think so most of the surgeons are doing but few of them have uh, uh, not been doing but it is really encouraging and good to do even i am doing endoscopies some therapeutic procedures also lot of the surgeons are doing but few of them are not doing but who are not doing are especially post graduates it's high time we should all start learning about endoscopy and start doing endoscopies it really helps ultrasound and endoscopy go hand in hand and we should all of us adapt this uh, both the Uh, procedures which will help us in uh, surgery and laparoscopy also uh, with this uh, note i think so uh, now i request uh, dr shivram sir to say a few words and then we can finish thank you thank dr. you sir i think uh, both of them gave a very good talk and dr naz and dr uh, sopimat thank you Sir, your voice is not heard. Some connectivity problem, I think. Possible. Yeah, now it's okay, sir. Yes, okay. Sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. Okay. So both of them gave amazing talk and very clear messages, very motivating to young youngsters and all of us. And we thank all of both of them from KSC ASC. Any comments from uh, Dr. Siddesh, uh, Dr. Satish? Sudesh, please. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, I'm sorry, I had to leave in the middle for uh, another meeting, and I, I was very eager to come back as soon as that meeting got over because uh, even Nas spoke so well in the beginning, and I could catch up last ten minutes of Sadashiv. I think both of them are seasoned campaigners in their own field, and they have done an excellent job. I'm sure their uh, way of presentation itself has. motivated many people who are there for uh, it to start and uh, i hope as rajgopal shane suggested in the beginning this uh, video is put up in our website i hope more students catch up with this and see at the leisure and get motivated 
and i think asi equal to answer question asi during my presidentship have launched both training ultrasound as well as endoscopy for surgeons and be on a lookout on the website of asi there are training programs which are spread around the uh, year uh, we have identified six centers of excellence and these uh, centers which are nearby to you you can plan or even if it is farther you can plan as a visit to that center uh, as a part of your uh, uh, tour and then spend a weekend there and as uh, sadashiv put it this is not going to be your way of i mean give a credentialing or make you an expert to start doing endoscopy that will be just a beginning and an introduction to you and you to make you feel confident that you also can do endoscopy so that is what asi is up to and the charges are very very meager and there is only thing is you will have to look after your travel and accommodation otherwise asi is ready and it is sponsored to a greater extent by olympus they contribute quite a huge sum for each of it, these courses and we are not going to exceed more than 10 to 12 in each uh, to candidates for each of these course and uh, we are going to do a pre course online mentoring which will enable you to get primed and then come prepared for this training and you can look up to this what you can get from out of this training you can be uh, aware before joining and then post training post this program you will continue to be mentored by these experts uh, who are on online whenever you find time in difficulties with a specific query you can approach and you can continue learning uh, that is what asi is planning so be on a lookout those who wanted want to start endoscopy this is what we have to offer from asi thank you very much thank you sir, uh, just one announcement sir uh, on yes. 4th and 5th of uh, august there is a training program in hubli yes. Yes. Uh, which uh, dr siddhay sir and dr sukhimat sir are uh, going to be the mentors there and uh, uh, whoever yes. are interested can join it is just 5000 rupees registration and you can be part of this uh, endoscopic upper gi endoscopy training program thank you thank you dr uh, rajan please any comment sir Good evening, sir. Rajan, sir. Long time. I'm seeing you. So nice. <laughs> Good evening. Sorry, I had to also go with Dr. Sudesh to the other RRC meeting. So I saw the first quarter of Nas and the last quarter of Dr. Sopimat, and both filled me so much. So I know I've missed three fourths of each of them, but I was very happy with that I was there. Sir, this is a sir. remarkable explanation uh, explanation of how an ancillary tool becomes your diagnostic kit and that is a part of the armamentarium that every surgeon should have so i uh, congratulate kscsi for bringing out these things and the point is to do this repeatedly then only it gets uh, taken in so thank you so much sir thank you nas ma'am both were <clears throat> excellent presentation my pleasure thank sir you. Sir, in the big cities, there is resistance from medical gastroenterologist uh, for surgeons doing endoscopy, like in uh, super specialty hospitals and all. How to come over it? How to convince them? That is where this licensing and uh, the credentialing comes in. So we need the SI to give us uh, fixed courses where surgeons can do it and get a, a certificate of competence and then allow it to be done by the surgeons. The corporate setups and the, um, you know, the NABH accredited institutions, they have this problem of specialty and credentialing and they don't allow general surgeons to do the ultrasound as well as the um endoscopy yes uh, dr I, I, I have a point to add here see uh, i sir, think he's Rajan speaking sir, you, are, you want to add anything more Rajan, speaking, not, speaking, your line was cut not audible okay, sir. okay. okay. so okay. Uh, sorry uh, anyway, just no. would like to add in the mca curriculum ms training program has a basic diagnostic endoscopy and colonoscopy in their curriculum. No, Siddesh. It's no. a recent NMC guideline which I saw, which I have put the screenshot there. 
I have put the screenshot. I quoted also. It is not no. there. No, no. Actually, it was there when I was a HOD. Earlier, 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 MSA had that also. Oh. I put a slide. I think you hmm. missed that slide. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Probably that, that I is put where... a mail to SA. Yes. Yes, yes. So this is the time where SA can pressurize the uh, MCI, the new NMC guidelines, to include this yes. as because it is an important yes. thing as an armamentarium in the Department of Surgery. So the Department of Surgery in each medical college should put up the request to acquire an independent unit. Only then the people will get trained. Agreed. Otherwise, Agreed. I will tell you what happened. I think uh, Rajan told it in a nutshell. It is not just confined to uh, the corporate culture. Even in medical colleges, you know, each medical college has a medical gastroenterology department now uh, and there lies the trouble. Even if you are well qualified, well trained, you are a taboo to enter into their domain. That is what they feel. But it is very high time. We have to re-emphasize what surgeons were doing on their contribution uh, for field of endoscopy and how important it is for us to continue doing it. So all over the world, if you travel UK, it is there. Basic endoscopy is done by surgeons. And uh, even you go far east, you know, whole of China, Hong Kong, Korea, you go everywhere, far east, it is a surgeon's domain. So I think there is a point which you can put, we need to work in the right time, in a right level. So it requires a little bit of hard work. I'm sure we'll uh, try to push this in ASI. I still go to work some more time to work as an office bearer, I will try to push this. And these courses are going to be there. Anyway, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sudesh. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Dr. Chandrasekhar. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Conclusion, sir. On uh, behalf of KCA, sir, I uh, would like to thank uh, both the speakers, Dr. Nazmayam and uh, Dr. Prasada Shiv Sopimet, sir, and the moderator, uh, Hepsur, sir, and all the members who have attended and our immediate national president, uh, Dr. Sudesh, sir, also. And one announcement what we have is next program, we have a very important that is midterm conference. Midcon is coming up in Kolar, that is 12th and 13th of August. I request everyone to register for that and please do attend. And there you can encourage the postgraduates also. We have a few interesting topics, panel discussion. We have this time we have introduced panel discussion from the postgraduates. So I request everybody to please register and attend the uh, Midcon conference. Yeah. Uh, thank you, one and all. Uh, thank, thank you very you. much. Good night. The program is almost everything finalized. I think uh, Dr. Kalaiwani and Dr. Chandrasekhar will put in the website tomorrow. Yes, sir. Have... No? Yes, it's yes. It's ready, sir. sir. It's ready. Be done. ready. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. KSA, thank you Dr. Thanks Nas. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good very night. good presentations. Good night. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Good night. Martin, you are there? Yes, sir. Browser. Midcom browser. Uh, I have already sent you, sir, in the evening itself. Evening, huh? Okay. Yes, sir. Just go through. I didn't see. I'll go through. Any messages you got from the post? Uh, as per no, uh, no, sir. We'll wait till, till tomorrow. No, uh, sure, uh, sure, sir. Yeah. Uh, then we'll Saturday. Saturday we'll sit up and finish up that uh, this one. Sure uh, okay. Solution of pages, uh, papers. Hmm? Okay, sir. Fine. Thank you. I'll just go through this. Uh, uh, this one. Brochure, uh, sir. Brochure. Any corrections are there? I'll let you know. Hmm? Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, Martin. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. You sent a message, ah? Uh? Uh, no, sir. I'll just send it now. I just you send lots uh, of messages even to that uh, this one uh, case presentation uh, chairpersons are there, na? Uh, yes, sir. You send message WhatsApp message to all chairpersons. Uh, okay, sir. Huh? Yes, sir. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can send me. Uh, you have a format, na? In that format, uh, it was nice. The mail what you have done that was really nice. So similarly, you can send it in the WhatsApp also. Uh, sure, sir. I can do it, sir. Yeah, yeah, that, that will be fine. Send it to all the chairpersons also. Huh? Uh, okay, sir. Yeah. Okay, Martin. Thank you. Yes, sir.